First of all, thank you very much for in accepting the invitation of Voice of Revolution, which is a group of Iranian activists who are uh, trying to organize regular weekly meetings on issues of interest to uh, comrades inside Iran, but also outside Iran. So, um, most people have read the work you've done in English. The Iranian comrades will see Farsi translation of some of this work. And we are going to do it like a conversation, like a general overview of your research, maybe to follow it up with um, other, if you agreed, other uh, talks where it would be more specific. So I wanted you to explain to our audience what you think of the human revolution, its origins, what it entails, and the work you've done on this. So, okay, well, first, let me say what an honor it is for me to be invited to speak to um, Iranian brothers and sisters. Um, uh, it, it, it's a real privilege. I'm ov obviously very well aware of um, th events which have been happening um, in, in Iran um, in, in recent years, and particularly, of course, the um, Women, Life, Freedom uprising. And so I've been asked about the human revolution. So just to say, I think everybody these days who's an educated person would agree with Darwin's idea that we humans have evolved um, and that we are related to other creatures quite similar to ourselves. And we call those other creatures great apes. And um, many people kind of leave it there and say, Yes, we gradually evolved. All animals are on this planet in their different uh, forms, owing to gradualistic um, natural selection. My own view is that as soon as you think about our own species, I, we, we are just very, very strange creatures. <laughs> and although clearly I th I'm convinced, like all scientists are, that we must have evolved, my own view is that piecemeal, incremental, gradual evolution at one point during our evolutionary past culminated in much more rapid and in fact revolutionary change. And in some critical respects, during that, what I call the human revolution, um, we turned the world upside down. So let me just explain a little bit about that. Um, all Darwinians would say that we're closely related genetically um, to um, other great apes. So the great apes means um, orangutans, um, gorillas, uh, chimpanzees, and anyone who's had any familiarity with these relatives of ours, these cousins of ours, would immediately see that they have facial expressions, they 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 kind of grin, they they make gestures, they 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 look at you as if they want to know what you're going to do next. And there's so many features of these uh, relatives of ours, which um, just remind us of, of how closely we are related to them. But now let's come to um, social relationships. Um, so we've long known ever since um, somebody called Jane Goodall began to do field research uh, in a place called Gombe Stream in Tanzania, that she was the first person really to do serious long-term research of wild living chimpanzees. Um, it turned out that these creatures are extremely um, despotically male dominated. Every male dominates every female. Every male that comes of age asserts his dominance over some female, very often his mother. And of course, the fact that chimpanzees have this patriarchal male dominated structure has led so many theories to say, well, you know, patriarchy, competition, conflict, violence, warfare, um, these things are natural. After all, our closest genetic relatives, the chimpanzees, are organized along very similar lines. Um, and what these people forget is that we are equally closely related genetically to a particular kind of um, chimpanzee 
um, and they're called bonobos, and <laughs> they're just so, so completely different. We're just as closely related to these other chimpanzees that live south of the Congo River in Africa, in Central Africa, um, and they are female-dominated. Um, the females form close relationships with each other, and any male trying to um, push them out of the way to eat some food, eat some food which the females might have wanted, and particularly any male who even vaguely threatens um, an infant, what will happen is that the, the females would gang up together and um, <laughs> they'll beat him up, and they they will establish their very um, decisive dominance over the male. And this is now recognized by everyone. And so what's curious is the fact that um, although when chimpanzees are talked about by scientists, they say, well, that makes male dominance natural. Um, they also know that um, these other chimpanzees, the bonobos, they used to be called pygmy chimpanzees, just to clarify the, the species I'm talking about. They're just, they're just as closely related to us genetically, no difference at all, um, but they're matriarchal. And um, of course, we don't find scientists saying that's why matriarchy is so natural and common and <laughs> just part of human nature. We're all matriarchal, aren't we? Because we descend from some creatures which must have been very like bonobos. So now what it, it turns out that the critical feature is um, whether or not the females can um, bond with each other. So if there's plenty of food to go around, if they have a, 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 lo a local environment where there's enough food to go around, which there is south of the Congo River, what happens is the females will forage together. And while they're foraging together, they will be forming close relationships with each other. And those relationships, those females will use as leverage against any attempt by a male to push them around. Whereas in the area where um, Jane Goodall did her field work um, in Tanzania, it much, was much less um, rich environment, much more sparse and uh, what happens then is that every female has to fight for her own little bit of territory her own little patch of, of foraging area and she doesn't want to be too close to another female because that will be competition and so all the females are kind of competing against each other which leaves the males um in a position to take advantage of their isolation from each other so the males um uh, uh, operate together as a kind of coalition they 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 um, control the range of the whole ch chimpanzee community and you get a, a, a pretty severe form of male dominance. Um, but, okay, just th think about humans. Um, I, I said that we are a very strange um, species. Perhaps the most kind of really strange thing about us is the fact that we have language. Um, and... Um, Okay, I mean, other animals communicate, whales, dolphins, elephants, I mean, well, of course, chimpanzees as well. They, they have very sophisticated systems of communication. Um, but language is different. I mean, it really is off the scale. Um, partly the structure of language is, is, is different. It has a formal structure, which makes it radically different, um, but perhaps more easily understandable is the fact that when we talk we are sharing complete fantasies nobody just talks about stuff going on immediately around like for, for I'm, I'm talking now but no, none of the things i'm discussing are happening in this room where i'm sitting um it's all shared imaginings shared remembrance shared plans um so language uh, um, enables us to share our dreams and share our memories and share our plans. So you might think, well, okay, a, a chimpanzee perhaps could do the same. So let's imagine, for example, um, a female chimpanzee, she might have been having a bit of a dream. Who knows? I don't know whether they, what kind of dreams chimpanzees have, but she may, she may possibly have been dream, dreaming about some really wonderful part of the rainforest where there's lots of bananas. But when she wakes up from the dream, can she describe what she's been seeing in her during her sleep partly is is kind of could she and i don't think she could i mean all kinds of sounds that chimpanzees can make um pan toots food calls copulation squeals all kinds of hoots and cries um but they they are very they're pretty uninformative about what's going on inside the head of a chimpanzee but perhaps an even more important question is supposing that chimpanzee could tell others about her dream so she's, she's had an experience of, of 
dream bananas, imaginary bananas, how interested would the other chimps be in dream bananas? And I think you can immediately see they would be very interested in real ones, but pretend ones, imaginary ones, um, probably not. And this is one of the most peculiar things about us humans. We are so interested in each other's minds. We, I mean, for, for, for us humans, the most interesting thing isn't just a table or a chair or something out in the real world. I mean, of course, we have to take notice of that. Otherwise, we wouldn't survive. But we are so interested in what, what we are all thinking about. And as soon as people meet up, that you know, they're immediately interested. How have you been? How are you? What are you thinking of? What are your plans? What you know, how are the kids, all the various things which aren't immediately available. And language enables us to share those things. And um, it's so different from anything that um, non-human animals, including chimps, um, do, that something strange must have happened during the course of evolution. And perhaps I'll just add to that, there's a whole branch of Darwinian theory called signal evolution theory. And that's a whole body of science which looks at how animals uh, communicate and how the signals that they produce, how they evolve over time. Um, and the, the, the major founder of this branch of Darwinism, his name is Amat Zahavi, he observed that the, the kind of system we humans have is just theoretically impossible. I mean, he, one of his comical things he said at a conference, he just said, well, yeah, language, um, good idea. Um, it'll never work <laughs> because with language, we, we make up things as we go along. We, we just invent like the meanings of words. I mean, you know, the, the word dog doesn't wag its tail, doesn't piss up lampposts, doesn't, it, it doesn't mean dog. It's only, it only means what we say it does because we just reach a little agreement about it. Whereas animals want to be sure that when they hear a sound, it's reliable evidence of its message. So other animals, they require reliability that they're not being deceived, they're not being tricked. Um, and that's particularly true with clever animals like chimpanzees and humans. Of course, you can think about humans as being kind of particularly clever versions of great apes. But, but chimpanzees are so clever that they are constantly trying to trick each other. Um, and so if a chimpanzee could tell another chimpanzee where the food is, the listener would probably think, well, that's certainly where it isn't because <laughs> you know, the chimpanzee doesn't, wouldn't really want to share, share that food. They're very competitive creatures. And so what it means is that the chimps are constantly on guard against being tricked or deceived. And they want every signal which is emitted to be reliable proof of, of the message. So, for example, when a, when a, a chimpanzee finds food, it gets excited and it makes what's called a food call. And it's almost as if it's, it's, it's salivating. It's, it's getting excited about the food. And you can, it's like audible salivation. You can hear the excitement. And the different types of food produce a slightly different type of food call. But, but Jane Goodall once watched a chimp who found some bananas because she made a bit of a mistake during her early field work. She kept providing bananas to the chimps and it rather messed up you know, the, the, the natural way they would have communicated. But anyway, she, she provided this young chimp with a whole bunch of bananas and it wanted them all for itself. And she just described this funny picture of the, of the chimp trying to hold its mouth to stop it making a food call so that no one would hear. But the, and that's simply is telling you that the, the food call is an irrepressible cry. It's, it finds it almost impossible to, to stop itself from divulging that it's, it, that it's excited about the food. And the same applies to I mean, it's a bit, might sound a bit strange, but primatologists tend to be very interested in things like copulation squeals. <laughs> so when a, when a female chimp is having sex, it'll make a sound, but can, she can only make that sound if she's actually having sex. So you hear that sound and you just know what's going on. So the pantoots, the warbarks, I mean, all the different sounds which they're making, they're, they're evidence of things going on. Um, and they're, also they're quite costly. You have to put, you have to put your body into those signals. I mean, I, I perhaps I'll, I'll sort of attempt, and not a very good way, to describe what my um, friend Andrew Fowler once taught me. He taught me how to produce a, what's called a pantoot, a chimpanzee pantoot. And it goes something like this. Um, forgive me, don't worry, I'm not going crazy. I'm just trying to produce a chimpanzee pantoot. But it's something like... <laughs> Uh, 
Um, okay, and they have to put quite a lot of energy and emotion. And even now, when I come out of that, having made that sound, I feel a little bit, oh, God, <laughs> that was a bit of, a bit of an effort. I mean, and it's what's called a costly signal. You have to put your body into the signals. You have to put your body into the population squeal, the food call, the pantoot, and all these different signals. And now think of humans. You know, we, we make a sound and we add a tiny little switch to it. We just make a little, a little, we, we, for example, we, we might be, I don't know, about to use um, a, a consonant, like a, what we call a voice consonant, a buh. Um, okay, switch off the voice and you've got a p. You've made the difference between a bin and a pin. I mean, okay, I mean, but you can imagine circumstances where that might be, uh, you know, a difference between life and death. Like, you know, um, we, we, I don't know, uh, I'm, we, will, we will meet you tomorrow. Um, okay, take off the M from the word uh, meat. Uh, we will eat you tomorrow. Um, I mean, that's not that's not the same at all. But have you noticed it costs nothing? It, you just switched off the voicing, and those 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 are called um, distinctive features in language. And they're they're actually they're off and on signals. They're rather like computer speak. They're like noughts and noughts and ones. Um, so in, in that sense, language is digital. A tiny difference, switching on nasalization, switching off nasalization, switching on voicing, switching it off, all those little things we do all the time automatically. We don't even think about it, of course. It's all pretty unconscious because we've learned the language. Um, but those things make life and death or extremely you know, contrastive differences, rather like pressing a different key on a computer. Whereas with that pantoot, ooh, 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 the, the, when the chimpanzees hear that pantoot, they're not interested in, oh, that's a pantoot. No, no, no. They're interested in quite how aroused, how angry, how filled with emotion, how big I am. You know, so they hear a chimpanzee and they're interested in the in the graded differences between the calls. And so we call those animal signals, they're, they're called graded or analog, more or less signals, as opposed to digital. So getting from analog signaling to digital signaling, which we must have done in human evolution, was something very, very special and um, quite remarkable. And I, in my own view, if you look at, say, the fact that we have this amazing planet we live on, and which capitalism is obviously severely threatening, um, it, it is, I mean, you know, I'm a scientist, so I'm not going to say it's a miracle, <laughs> but it's extraordinarily unlikely that it'd ever get me and you and us lot on this planet um, up and running after all this this time. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, the chances against a living planet are extraordinary. And when life first began to evolve on this planet, it was, I'm not going to say miraculous, not exactly, but it was so improbable as to be almost impossible. And yet we know that it happened. It must have been something very strange and unusual about this planet, which made life possible on it. And, and actually we now know it's something to do with the fact that another Mars-sized planet uh, smashed into us um, four and a bit billion years ago and it turned into the moon and it, it donated its iron to the planet and it it, it, it stabilized the tilt and gave us a, a particular form of st quite strong gravitation and it, it meant that the, 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 the death rays emanating from the sun got deflected that's what we see at the northern lights and it had to hit the planet at exactly a particular degree uh, and, and to, you know to get the conditions right for life to evolve on earth now, why am I saying all that? I'm saying that because, in a way, that was a revolution. The, the movement from chemistry to biology was something quite remarkable. It, it was a, a revolutionary change, if you like. And then in the course of the evolution of life on Earth, we've, we've actually had quite a number of revolutionary changes, right up to the origin of us humans, which was another revolutionary change. Something special happened to make us the, the, the speaking um, creatures that we are. So I've always been interested in, okay, well, what exactly, what exactly did happen? I'll take a bit of breath there. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll carry on. Um, so, I mean, there's a whole body of theory which says that what made us human was violence. We're particularly violent creatures, and and so okay, that's the theory of kind of man the toolmaker, man the mighty hunter, man the toolmaker, and as soon as you think about the tools, they weren't um you know they weren't chisels, um they weren't saws, they were they were weapons, and the whole point of the weapons was to kill. Um, hopefully, we could you could say when we developed these weapons, 
we were becoming hunters and killing the animals around us, as opposed to another possibility, which would, would be that we were killing each other. Um, that has to be mentioned because chimpanzees do practice something you know, remarkably like warfare. So the, the, the chimpanzees um, that Jane Goodall studied and, and others north of the Congo River, not the bonobos, are those um, chimpanzees. They patrol their boundaries. And uh, when a group um, meets up with a neighboring group, the, the, there's often a, quite a scuffle. And what happens is that the, each each bunch of male chimpanzees patrolling the boundary, if they catch um, an isolated enemy individual, um, that individual very much would risk losing its life. Now, they don't use artificial weapons, they, and they're not very good at killing each other. It takes quite a, quite a long time, but they can they can do it. And of course, chimpanzees can pick up rocks and sticks and wave them around. And you've only got to imagine what might have happened had we remained socially and sexually like common chimps and then discovered how to um, make weapons. Why would those chimps organize in that way when they use those weapons? Why would they have only used them against other animals instead of against each other? I mean, you know, presumably, you know, we, we kind of didn't, we, we really wouldn't be here if, if all of us, our ancestors had, had done that. But you still need to ask kind of why. Um, and, until Jane Goodall did her work, some people thought of chimpanzees as um, nice, cuddly, egalitarian, and a communist, communist I suppose. Uh, I'm afraid that is not true at all, not of common chimps. And they're in fact quite fond of meat. So chimpanzee males, they will they will uh, cooperate to to catch um a, say a colobus monkey, a particular kind of monkey, in the trees not high up above their heads, and they will they will one chimp will brush up brush up the tree, usually picking on a on a juvenile monkey or maybe a mother with her infant, and then the other chimps will block the block off the exits, you know, it's different parts down on, on the base of the of the trees. And then what will happen is the chimpanzee that's nearest might manage to catch the the poor little um Colobus um, monkey, and they they don't really kill it, or at least they do, but they kill it by pulling it apart in order to eat it. So one chimpanzee will have one arm, another chimp will have the other arm, and they will sort of by eating the animal, it will gradually get become dead, of course. But there's, they don't, they're not very efficient at at, at the killing process. Uh, and again, I'm simply saying that because if you imagine that we were something like chimps and we evolved and became increasingly capable of making weapons. Okay, that we may often have used them in the in the hunt, in not just hunting um, colobus monkeys, but small antelopes and other creatures, and, and perhaps competing with lions to steal their kills from them, which is a, very likely what what would have happened. Um, but the point I'm I'm trying to make is that it would have been those, if you like, weapons of mass destruction. We, we could even call them that. Um, would have led to extinction rather than the success of our ancestors um, it would have led to viol more violence against each other against the males if they were using that violence probably more violence against females much worse uh, quality of child care there's no reason to expect that would have increased population sizes of our ancestors to the point where we became the very successful species that we are but yet despite that um the the idea that warfare made us human it's more it's more like standard theory. It's more the prevailing narrative than the theory that I have, along with my colleagues in evolutionary science. The, the warfare theory is, is deemed to be more popular. Um, and as my colleague um, Sarah Hurdy over in the States says, it's, more, it's probably more popular because it, it, he, she uses this lovely term, it fits the bill. It's, it's kind of convenient to argue that warfare is what made us human. Yeah, and just 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 to just to explain, the idea is that we humans are very cooperative. You need cooperation and trust and mutual solidarity in order to develop things like language. And the idea is that only when faced with a common enemy will any group develop sufficient internal solidarity for language to evolve. So the idea is that it was in opposition to a, sh a shared threat, a shared enemy in warfare, that that, that they developed sufficient internal solidarity to make um, language. Um, and, and the other things which make us the, the cooperative species we are, um, the, you know, made, made those things possible. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> as I say, uh, if you think that violence is what makes us human, that's great. The point, the point about language 
is that it, it's the antithesis of violence. You, you're either on speaking terms with each other or you're communicating using seduction, temptation, threat, you know, and all those things with constantly with sort of violence somewhere behind the scenes. And, and really, if as any society where you achieve your goals through violence is going to it's going to put language somewhere else it, you know the, the decisive thing will be the violence not the not the not the language even if you've got some kind of proto language up and running um so i, I think a completely different kind of explanation is needed and the, the point is that we've already got it in a sense darwinism already provides us with that because according to darwin evolution proceeds by two um, mechanisms. One is called natural selection. So over, over evolutionary time, the, the earliest horses through natural selection develop you know, faster and faster legs. They get more and more efficient at running fast and escaping from you know, wolves, for example, or other predators. So that's natural selection and it's it's a slow process, uh, but but a steady one. And it's, it's hugely responsible for the diversity of life we see on this planet. And then there's another whole dynamic, which he called sexual selection. Um, and sexual selection is very different because it doesn't lead to increasing efficiency. It actually leads to a kind of extravagance and wastefulness. Um, so if you think of a peacock, why is the peacock developing such you know, extravagant tail and feathers and an extraordinary display? It's because it needs to convince peahens, who are pretty skeptical, skeptical they don't believe everything a male says so the male's coming along and saying i'm the best peacock around here have sex with me and you'll have very fit babies and the peahens here yeah but you'll say that prove it and so the so the males are put into competition with each other and what happens is of course that they you know they end up with such extraordinarily cumbersome accident prone and parasite prone you know displays that i mean any any fox could quickly <laughs> quickly catch one of them um so they, and they because they can hardly fly so sexual selection lives in very different um directions but one of the critical things about sexual selection is that it differentiates males from females not just in terms of anatomy but also in terms of behavior in, in terms of strategies to get your genes into the future so i'm i, I was at one stage not very popular on the left because to me it was perfectly obvious that um, a gene is a molecule um, designed to replicate itself. And so any gene that replicates the competition at its own expense, it would quickly be an X gene. The whole point of a gene is it replicates self, not, not other. That used to be called selfish gene theory. And it was completely uh, misrepresented as somehow a justification for Thatcherism and selfishness. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with that at all, nothing whatsoever. So, for example, you know, social insects such as bees, they're incredibly selfless. A, a, one bee will happily, I say happily, but I mean, it will sting somebody even if it means its own death for the sake of the, of the hive, of the colony. And that's because the gene is very intimately shared with other members of the same colony. And it makes sense for the gene to let this particular um, insect die because the genes, of course, will then be um, replicated as a, as a result of that so i mean genes are self if you like quotes metaphorically selfish replicators but the critical point is that when as soon as you get um male and female and particularly when you get mammals so mammals of course are creatures with 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 um, mammaries with breasts there's a, a a huge sort of imbalance in terms of the work done by each sex to produce the next generation begins to emerge so the female a female chimpanzee a female you know mammal really any she, she does all the work of um, pregnancy and then childbirth, all the pain and, and, and risk of childbirth. And then on top of all that, she does the breastfeeding and uh, compare that enormous amount of labor, if you like, investment of energy and time by the female compared to that with the male, uh, with the mammal. The male just um, you know gets you pregnant and that's all he needs to do. A tiny bit of sperm doesn't really cost anything. And, and, and then the other sex does all the work of getting, the, getting his genes into the future. So we have a, we have a disparity. And as a result of that, you're, you're likely to get with um, mammals, including primates, the uh, conflict of interest. Now, again, the left often criticized me and my colleagues for, uh, for arguing for conflict in, in our ancestors. But I see conflict as the engine of change. I'm, I'm a Marxist. <laughs> 
Karl Marx described class conflict as the engine of all history. So every, you know, we get a conflict between the, the two classes, the class that does the work and the class that gets other people to do the work. You can say that's a rather simplified, oversimplified picture of <laughs> class society. One sex does all the work, one class does all the work, one class does, you know, gets other people to do the work. But still, to me, there's a, there's a certain, at least formal um, parallel there. Um, so we, we kind of expect the males and the females to have different interests. So the, and that's again, it's it, it obviously it has a huge danger of of reinforcing sex role stereotypes. Um, but I'm going to explain that actually what happened in the human case was that all those stereotypes got completely radically turned upside down and reversed. So um, a, a female once she's got pregnant, she she's not too interested in sex. I'm talking about mammals now, not necessarily humans. So the, 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 and this is I'm talking about the stereotype: a, the, a female uh, chimpanzee once she's pregnant, she, her 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 job now is to get that baby up and running, to find food for herself, to look after the baby, to protect it, to shelter it, and and so on. Of course, the male he can just leave her; he can just go on and get somebody else pregnant. Um, so we have that. Conflict, but of course, for chimpanzee females, who cares? I mean, she doesn't need. She, why, she's not worried about a, an unfaithful partner because the partner's pretty useless. I mean, he's probably more trouble than he's worth. If he did hang around, he'd be looking, looking, <laughs> trying to get her, her, his first partner to move to somewhere where we could have sex with somebody else. So, so what happens is that the chimp, the chimpanzee females, you know, they don't, they don't. The idea of sexual monogamy or fidelity is completely irre irrelevant. She, you know, who, who, she doesn't need any more sperm. Um, a tiny bit of sperm gets you 100% pregnant, whereas from the point of view of the of, of the male, he does he can make he can gain what's called fitness, which is genetic advantage by finding another female to get pregnant. So that's going to be a kind of conflict. Um, okay, but but it's very different when it comes to food. So uh, so what I'm saying here is that in the course of human evolution, and it's quite a story, certain things began to happen. And we have kind of, as I said earlier, we have two kind of models. We have the model of the common chimps with extreme male despotism. We have a very different model of the bonobos who are matriarchal. And in some ways with bonobos, these are the other chimpanzees south of the Congo River, it's actually um, the infants who are almost the, the, the dominant stratum of society because Every infant is carefully watched. This is the bonobos. Every infant is carefully watched by its mother and all her female allies. And any would-be dominant male who begins to mess with an infant, suddenly he finds all the females coming to the infant's protection. And so it, we almost have a, a whole society almost ruled by infants in the sense that the infants <laughs> are benefiting most from the social um the social dynamics so we have these two models matriarchy and patriarchy in my own view um we humans took neither course and we did something immeasurably more interesting we kind of did both and combined them in periodicity we had an element of matriarchy and then an element of patriarchy and we moved between the two and we didn't move between the two on a hundred year, thousand year, monthly, you know, we didn't we didn't move the two on a kind of long term basis. We we actually moved between the two, using one of the basic rhythms of this Earth Moon Sun system that we are on planet Earth. So um, yes, I mean, <laughs> tell me where I go now. Okay, I will I will I will come to my favourite subject. <clears throat> okay, okay. <clears throat> all um, well, nearly all. All great apes, anyway, have a menstrual cycle. Now, we call it a menstrual cycle, and the word menstruation means, etymologically, it means moon change. But actually, the cycles of our female great ape relatives have got very little to do with the moon, at least not all of them have very much to do with the moon. So take a bonobo. A bonobo has a cycle, uh, you know, a, 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 a kind of menstrual cycle, but it, it's 40 days in length. A chimpanzee has a, has a cycle which is 36 days in length. Um, orangutans have a bit more like, a little bit closer to us, around 29 days in length. Um, and other 
other primates, if we take all the different monkeys and apes, they have a kind of, they oscillate between a lot shorter than um, 29 days and a lot longer than 29 days. But the, the thing about the human female is this, that the human female has exactly the length of cycle that we would predict if synchronizing your cycles using some kind of clock um, helped you. So imagine a situation where it would be in evolving human females advantage to synchronize their menstrual cycles um then we have that length of cycle because the length of the human cycle on average now of course everybody knows that as you grow older it tends to speed up a bit and when you're in your teens it's a little bit longer but during the the, the period of your life when you're most likely to get pregnant somewhere in your 20s your cycle will be the closest to 29 Point 0.5 days <laughs> and it's like guess what 29.5 days is the time it takes for the moon to pass through its phases as seen from the earth and um, i don't know it's it's somehow regarded as um controversial these days to to suggest that there might have been a reason for that particular length of menstrual cycle and and of course i i've been faced with People who just said, oh, it's moonshine. Oh, don't worry about it, Chris. It's just one of those coincidences. And I, tr and I always say in response to that, well, yes, it may be a coincidence, but before dismissing it as just an, an, an irrelevant, uninteresting, random coincidence, why not explore whether there might have been some adaptive advantage in having a cycle which enabled one woman to connect up with others using a clock? I mean, of course, the only available clock would be the moon. Now, uh, so I'm going to be arguing now that that was absolutely critical to this human revolution, which we're, we're talking about. Now, what are my grounds for thinking that? What is it about 29.5 days or the moon, which could have been so critically important during our evolutionary past? Well, think about it. Chimpanzees, including bonobos, live in dense tropical African rainforests. Um, and mostly, although they might sleep in nests at the night, in the night for safety, which they do, most of the time during the day, they're moving around on the ground, finding their food. And, and these are not necessarily very dense, dark rainforests, as they tend to be what we call savanna mosaic in the sense that there's patches of forest with the elephants usually make quite big open areas. There's plenty of little lakes and rivers and stuff. So it's not completely dark. But on the other hand, mostly moonlight doesn't get through um the, the you know the the the, the canopy um and now what seems to have happened about six million years ago is that we began increasingly moving down from the trees not directly into open savannah but into areas of mixed waterside wetlands we needed to be quite close to water rivers shorelines and females needed to be needed to be staying where they could still gather their own food because it would be a long long time in, in evolution before the, the male of the species began began to become helpful so coming down from the trees begin needed to wade across stretches of water the water would have weighed them up buoyed them up a bit uh, and, and you just need to you need to walk on two legs when you're crossing a, a, a shallow river Bonobos do that all the time, by the way. One of the reasons why the female bonobos are so powerful is because they live in kind of mixed waterside regions. They, they live in areas of lots of water, lots of streams, lots of small rivers, um, lake shores and stuff. And if you couldn't wade across the water, um, you'd just drown. And the water itself would have encouraged a kind of temporary, what we call bipedalism, walking on two legs with your body weighed up by the, the fact that... Now, what I'm, I'm saying there is actually never come rather surprisingly perhaps becoming pretty much standard theory somebody called Richard Rangham a real a, a student of Jane Goodall he's come round to the view that our initial environment as we came down from the from the trees would have been this you know it's called savannah mosaic I mean patches of grass patches of trees patches of water shallow water usually where there's plenty of food not moving right out into the hot dry savannah of the um the sort of um somewhat mystical narratives of the earlier part of the last century um but 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 still as you move out of the as you move out from the protection of the of the dense forests what happens is you, you become threatened by big cats um so okay lions 
again, this is not fully recognized, but I, I, one of one of my colleagues, I've, I've corresponded with him, Craig Packer, he did, a, he did a study of people in Tanzania getting eaten by a lion over, I think, 30 years. He, he and his colleagues just took these records. And what they found was an astonishing graph. The peak of humans getting eaten by a lion happened just after full moon because the, the lions have got brilliant night vision and they can see you when you can't see them. And they're quite lazy animals. They don't like to run for their lunch. They like to just creep up on you. And the best time is when the, when it's dark, but the particular time when there's maximum danger is just after full moon because the humans will be quite relaxed because they've, they've been having parties at full moon, meeting each other, feeling quite safe from the lions. And then the very next night, um, it, the sun the sun goes down and in Africa as the sun goes down you don't get you don't get twilight the sun goes down and it's just dark and it's dark for what 40 40 minutes or so and because the lions are hungry why are they hungry because <laughs> they couldn't hunt in the previous few days because of the moonlight because they can be seen they're particularly hungry now and they would just pounce on people and, and of course the humans were particularly vulnerable because they we, we would have been relaxing the previous night having you know having parties and you know, and all that Okay, the point I'm making is that there is a rhythm, and it's a it's like a rhythm. There's danger, safety, danger, safety, danger, safety, and you're safest when there's moonlight. You're most dangerous when there's no moonlight, and you just wouldn't dream. Our ancestors wouldn't have dreamed. A, you know, a young hominin male wouldn't have dreamed of going looking for romance, looking for love overnight <laughs> when there's no moon. He'd just be a lion's, a lion's, you know, a lion's meal. So you'd wait till near full moon before staying out all night which would then explain why ovulation would make a lot of sense around full moon and why menstruation would make much more sense around around dark moon. Dark moon would be a time when we can imagine our ancestors huddling together, seeking safety in numbers, close with their own kin. And, and, and of course, again, for my friend Jerome Lewis, he asks his his, his friends, the, 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 the Benjeli, um, the, the Benjeli Bayaka people, forest people of, of, of the Congo, why ask the women why when it's dark when there's no moon why do you sing all night why do you just keep singing and singing and singing and they just gave an answer they said we're, we're singing for our lives because <laughs> when we sing the predators um the large animals they they just they don't want to mess they just think oh these these people seem pretty well organized and um you know it'd be, it'd be risky so singing together is a way of maximizing the impression that you're a big bunch and a well-organized bunch don't mess with us so around dark moon, you'd be doing that. Around full moon, people would be more likely to be having parties and, and, and seeking romance. And so, I mean, and that, and don't forget that the very reason why we humans are such a sociable species, why we, you know, why we, why we always like congregating in relatively large groups is precisely to, to, to be safe from the, from the predators. So of course, if the, if the safety was on a regular pulse, a lunar pulse that would be that would make it that would help explain um the length of the cycle and of course one of the one of the one of the great things recently has been the, the new development of digital apps so lots of women these days in the west at any rate um wear these things on their wrists which just which, which to <laughs> record exactly what's going on in your with your hormones and we've got we've, got, we've now got thousands and thousands of women's data on the exact length of the menstrual cycle and it turns out to be as i said before 29.5 days and it's particularly 29.5 days if you take a bmi body mass index which is relatively lean um like hunter gatherers hunter gatherers you know there's very little fat out there the game animals aren't fat and you, and, and and when you start getting overweight the, the um the, the length of the cycle can change a bit but with, for, for people of the same kind of body mass index as hunter gatherers it's as near as damn it to a decimal point 29.5 days Tell me it's a coincidence i just think that's um I don't, I don't know it's just a kind of um a kind of political denial or something it's just somehow there's a kind of feeling that if as soon as you mention the moon you're into moonshine and you might even be in danger of things like lunacy or being, or being moonstruck and it's just patriarchal prejudice and, and scientists are sometimes so anxious not to be superstitious that they get they, they go into sort of reverse superstition they, <laughs> they completely distort their science in the, in the opposite direction to superstition, which of course is another version of, of superstition and it's all forgotten. Um, okay, now why does that matter? Okay, woo. Am I, am I doing all right? Yes, I mean, is it, am I, have I got much more time? Do you want me to carry on? No, plenty of time. 
I want you also, while you're talking, to refer to some of the things you do talk in your art articles, published work, in terms of why would you say hunter-gatherers were revolutionaries? Yeah, okay. And to refer to, uh, let's just stay with that. I'll do another session for the other right. question. No, no chimpanzee has ever been seen catch, getting some food and bringing, it back, bringing that food back for his kids or, or the female. I mean, a, a, a male gorilla is... You know, he's caring. He does. He does offer protection. He's if if the if the if the little gorillas are crossing a you know a new road made in the in the forest by loggers or something, he will he will be you know he will help them cross the road. He'll be quite caring, quite protective. He'll probably have two or three females, and um, but he but bringing food is just not something which any male does. Now, okay, I, I'm going to try and answer your question. Yes, I mean, the most brilliant probably development in human origins research in the last few decades has been the work of um, a paleoanthropologist, a biological anthropologist called Sarah Hurdy. You've probably heard of her. And um, it was Sarah who kind of discovered, and pretty much everyone agrees with this now, that when we talk about humans becoming cooperative, I mean, almost everyone agrees that we are astonishingly good at cooperating with, with each other and that's a huge part of the secret of our species um, success i mean even with the warfare lot they still use warfare to explain how we are cooperative they just think that we're cooperative within the in group but then we you know we're warring against the out group but every sort of everyone agrees that cooperation is a is a massive part of the story of human origins but what sarah hurdy has done is is pinpoint what kind of cooperation it must have been and she says right the hardest job is bringing up a kid that is a full-time job you know and some <laughs> and what happened is that sort of around maybe i'm gonna I'm, my dates aren't going to be particularly precise but somewhere around two million years ago with the beginning of what we call homo homo erectus the first homo what happened around that time was that the human female began living with her mum and therefore living with her sisters therefore living with relatives that she, female relatives that she could trust and so cooperation in childcare, becoming what sarah hurdy calls the babysitting ape was the critical initial form of human cooperation and you might wonder why a female chimpanzee doesn't help another chimpanzee with the baby it's because the female chimps don't trust each other um, because they're not related because the, the, all the, the females would have moved to an, another area to get pregnant to avoid being hassled by their own male relatives so they, they get the hell out of it then they haven't got their mother there or their sister therefore they don't trust the other females because they're all unrelated and also they're all competing with each other for little patches of foraging space so no female chimp would would even think of risking handing her baby that most precious thing to anyone else so a chimpanzee female is a single mum um which i mean you can you can be a single mum when you've got the welfare state but out there um being a single mum is going to be kind of difficult of course chimpanzees are fine because what happens is that the selection pressure on those females not to produce babies which are too demanding so it, what it does it produces a cap on brain size because the, the larger the brain of a baby the more demanding it is of high quality food the slower it is to mature the more care it needs and so and so what happens is that because the chimp females are going to be single mums that puts pressure on them not to have the kind of baby which will get them into trouble in other words have a relatively small brain baby it's still pretty big compared with other animals but it's relatively and you, and you get what's called the gray ceiling none of those fossil hominids have a brain size more than about 600 cc's but as soon as on the human case Human females began living with mum, therefore living with sister, therefore trusting each other, therefore sharing each other's childcare, doing babysitting. Suddenly, it's like you took the lid off um, the, the kind of size of brain that you could afford to have in your kid because you can you can offload some of those costs in terms of energy and time. You, you, you've got your sisters around, so you know. And then, of course, what then happens is that the um, the babies themselves have each other, so you get a large bunch of children. The six-year-olds looking after the four-year-olds, the eight-year-olds looking after the six-year-olds. You have, you have, and you, and you, and you just get a whole dynamic now, which is um, going to produce a, a completely new level of 
of what we call intersubjectivity, individuals who, who are interested in each other's mental states. We look into each other's eyes. We try to gauge from each other's eyes. They're called cooperative eyes, by the way. What are you looking at? What are you thinking? Uh, you know, all of us do that instinctively. Little babies, the first thing they look at is your eyes or mummy's eyes and, and, and any other carer's eyes. They try to work out what's, whether they can trust you. And they, they look into your eyes to see what you might be up to and, and, and thinking. Okay. I haven't answered the question yet. Now, the, the next thing is, what happened is that once human females had that level of sisterhood, that level of cooperation with each other, they could use that cooperation as leverage to get what they needed from the leisured sex. So in the past, the male sex had just got you pregnant and then sort of pissed off. But now these females in their coalitions, they could indicate to the males, if you want sex, we enjoy sex too, but you gotta you better make yourself useful. Because if you're gonna be completely useless and not provide any help <laughs> for childcare, not bring anything back, um, you know, you're gonna get the cold shoulder. And so evolving human females began to um kind of bargain with males and, and make males aware that if they wanted sex and you know, everyone kind of kind of wants wants sex of one kind or another, um, you're gonna to have to kind of earn it or deserve it. And so that was that was my initial theory that somehow human females needed to be able to say no, and it, again it might sound a bit strange this idea of no. Uh, chimpanzee females don't need to say no to sex because either they want sex or they don't. And if a chimpanzee chimpanzee females in estrus that is she's got a huge swelling, she's kind of got to have sex. And she's not going to say no, and she's going to have sex with a whole bunch of males. They form a kind of queue, and they all take turns. And then when she's anaesthetic, she's out of, she's no longer in that period. She doesn't need to say no because her body won't allow sex. A, a male can't get it up, and sex won't happen. And so you have this sort of yes, no on a biological basis. But what happened with the human female is that she became, once once males became relatively helpful, it became logical to not let the male know which was the biologically correct moment for sex. Because otherwise, there's obviously the danger, the male will just have sex with you, get you pregnant, and then, and then move off to somebody else. If, you, if, if, if males are useful things to have, and everyone should have at least one of them, the thing to do is to confuse the male by not giving away critically important information. So the human female has evolved to, to keep secret the precise moment of ovulation. So concealed ovulation goes with con what we call, again, continuous sexual receptivity. Obviously, that doesn't mean a woman you know, wants sex in the old time, but it does mean you can have sex if you want it. You don't, you're, not, you're not purely dependent on, on hormones. So those features come with a cost. It means that much more than other primates, the human female can be raped. It's possible for the female and female to be raped in a way which is much more difficult for a chimp whose whole body will signal no when she doesn't want sex. The male, the human male can easily, I don't know, imagine maybe to himself that she wants sex and then, and then use violence to get it. And so it's absolutely critically important in the course of human evolution that females found a way of dealing with that, with that problem through solidarity. And so somehow the human female had to evolve sort of special measures to establish what I've always called the world's most fundamental rule, much more important than the incest taboo, although actually the incest taboo comes out of it, it's, it's kind of part of it. But the rule against rape is the critical foundation of any kind of moral regulation of any kind of human society. As soon as, as rape's allowed, you know, forget about table manners, to forget about grammatical rules, forget about any kind of rule governed behavior. If rape's allowed, you know, nothing sacred, nothing, you know, no, no kind of tolerable human society is even remotely possible. So the human female had to find ways of making that clear. And it isn't that, it isn't that remarkable. In some ways, even the bonobo females, as I mentioned before, the bonobo females have huge amounts of solidarity and, and no one's ever no one's ever um, documented among bonobos the case of male coercive sex whereas with chimpanzees older brothers and fathers sometimes do attempt to have 
coercive sex with a female who might be in estrus, but definitely doesn't want that sex, and she's just unable to to prevent, you know, um, uh, actually sometimes getting pregnant by a brother, an older brother. But okay, but uh, I mean that, that that's that can happen, but it doesn't happen sufficiently um, frequently to be have sort of major sort of population effects. Uh, right. So when I say the human female managed to form coalitions to get the males to behave, what was required of those males? Well, males can be violent. In a way, that's the whole point of having these weapons and tools. And the critical thing is to make sure they're not violent towards you. They're violent towards um, um, antelopes, um, zebra, giraffe, other animals. I mean, we'd, it, before that, before big came hunting happened, we, human males would have been very likely, actually, because this happens with hunter-gatherer societies even today, uh, encountering lions. You, what you do is you go up to a lion with lots of sticks. You, you show no fear, and you but you let the lion eat the leg of the zebra or the other animal. And when it's had quite a bit of meat, you push the, you chase the lion away, and you take what's left. That's called power scavenging. It's it's not looking for old remains of meat. It's actually chasing the lions away. Let the lions do the killing. That would have that would have been quite a common strategy before you know, full scale, what we call logistic hunting, large game animal hunting would have happened. Um, so, okay, but can you see that in order to get the males to go hunting and making sex kind of the incentive for it, you have to prevent, um, you, you have to you have to be able to stop any sex happening prior to success in the hunt. And then, and then everything, you can see how everything begins to connect up. What would be the best time of month to to reach the climax of a big game hunt? Well, around Dark Moon, you don't want to do that because you might have you might have uh, speared the animal. It's trailing blood. You're chasing it, and then the sun goes down, and you're going to get eaten by a lion. So that would be that would be pointless. The best time to choose during the month will be the time of month when you have the longest possible day, when as the sun sets, the moon rises, which is around full moon, and so you have a kind of a, a kind of logic where you can have a, a once a month ceremonial hunt for a relatively large game animal um and then for the rest of the month you can you can kind of relax you, you're, you're kind of made and you can fall back on on smaller um uh, creatures and other types of um, foraged um, food um i haven't mentioned menstruation in this context uh, i better do that right now um my colleague um camilla power about what is it 30 years ago i think <laughs> criticized my book for having envisaged my book blood relations menstruation and the origins of culture where i first came out with what became called sex strike theory she criticized my my approach for i sort of imagine i sort of Im pictured menstruation as a as a kind of biological um no signal and i and of course it's actually kind of the wrong way around once camilla pointed out that once in the course of human evolution ovulation had been phased out as an external sign of fertility, it would have left one signal remaining, giving away the secret, if you like. So imagine a population of, you know, a local group, a camp of several women, um, some of them breastfeeding, some of them pregnant, some of them older, some of them younger. Now, one of them starting to, to, to cycle. She is, is, is divulging information that she she's imminently fertile and under under primate style conditions just imagine you know at the moment we don't have this thing which, which we call sexual morality a dominant male wanted to kidnap some female and take her away and have sex with her she's going to be the target i mean he wouldn't want to take away somebody who's already pregnant somebody who's breastfeeding but somebody who's just going to be just going to the, the menstrual signal would give away that information and so Camilla pointed out that the, that that would be a, a challenge. It's like in the course of evolution, ovulation has been phased out, but it's left something else. Now chimpanzees, chimpanzee males aren't interested in menstruation. Chimpanzees do menstruate, as I said, every you know quite you know have a long cycle, thirty six days, but the males just can't be bothered. Well, you know they got something much more exciting to pay attention to, which is the the great sexual swelling but once that's been phased out and only menstruation is left you you predict this threat of males competing with each other for access to that female and also 
a threat that that's, that signal of fertility on the part of that young uh, girl would itself be um, divisive. It would actually mean you know, the danger would be that, the, that having different uh, sexual signals would be divisive for the females. So Camilla just said, that's where human culture starts. What do the females do about it? The, the females get to her first. So her mother, her aunt, her sisters, as soon as they know that this young woman, age 14, 15, whatever, is starting to cycle, right, grab her, take hold of her. It's in her interest, by the way, that she isn't got pregnant by some dominant male who would then abandon her for the next one. So bring her into the club, bond with her, and form a kind of a, a, a form of such a solid united front around her to make it impossible for any male to pick and choose between females on, on biological grounds. So one of the things they could do is to smear the blood around, use, use the red juice from berries. But what actually happened was that over time, this, this iron oxide, this red clay called red ochre, began to be used as a kind of antidote to menstruation. So imagine a group of females, I can show some slides, but we're not doing that today. The Himba are a wonderful, wonderful example of how it looks to, for everybody to, to be covered in this beautiful red, beautiful beauty magic, this, pig, this pigment. Take the red ochre and um, everyone's, everyone's covered in it so that it's like everyone's fertile or everyone's displaying a, signi a, a signal of fertility. So it's as if the females were saying, you want sex to us? Fine. But if you want one of us, don't pick and choose. You're going to have to ha have all of us and keep all of us happy because we are a coalition. So go away. Um, if you want sex, go away, find a zebra, bring it back, um, and we'll think about it. It's kind of the message. And so we now have kind of a, a kind of, we have the, one of the best ways to think of it, I think, is to think about all the world's religions. I've always thought, I'm not particularly religious myself, although I was brought up a Roman Catholic, but there is something rather wonderful at the basis of all the world's religions. And it's this, some things are sacred. Not everything has a price. Not everything can be negotiated. Some things are sacred and the body above all, you know, has to be established as sacred and marked as um, sacred. Um, you can see, can't you, that women more than men would need that. Men can always resort to violence. Obviously, I'm perfectly well aware that women can be extremely violent as well. But when it comes to a competition on violence, I think in general, men are going to win that one. Um, and there, as I said earlier, there are some people who actually think that violence was what made us human. No, 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 no. <laughs> what made us human is the ability to sort things out using language as opposed to violence. And one of the sexes was more likely to benefit from that and, and establish that principle that the body is sacred than the other sex. And in my own view, it's absolutely indisputable that human females establish this principle, something that's sacred, marking their bodies with blood as the mark of the sacred. Uh, I mean, the evidence for that idea is kind of everywhere um, um, because, you know, you'll find right across all the world's religions, they're all about, deep down, the most sort of archaic elements of the world's, of Judaism and Christianity and Islam, all these religions, it's all about flesh and meat and blood in it. And what you do about the blood, who the blood belongs to, does it belong to the Lord? Can you can you eat the blood? Can you eat the meat raw? The sacredness of the blood, of course, as a Christian, I was brought up a Catholic, I'm very well aware of the blood of Jesus being so so critically important. Uh, and of course, the blood, that particular blood being one of the reasons why women weren't allowed to be priests and weren't allowed to be in church during their period. You don't you don't want the you don't want the real thing to be sort of challenging the you know the, the sacred religious kind of blood um so you know menstruation becomes sort of antithetical to another kind of of sacred blood but anyway the, the idea here is that menstrual blood is the first mark of taboo and sacredness a woman traditionally would say no keep away move into another realm go into seclusion taken into this thing we call seclusion by her sisters and, and mothers and and have a have a a, a, a sacred period of of what we call um, seclusion the, the very idea of the sacred means being set apart set apart from this world and that would happen on a monthly basis finally i can just, i can think again because um yes yes i mean you asked about what it is about hunter gatherers what's what again needs to be understood i think is that I, i'm not i'm not i don't want to at all be romantic about hunter gatherers some hunter gatherers are quite 
Um, I mean, you, you get storage hunter-gatherers. You get hunter-gatherers who store food um, in the northwest coast of the United States and Canada. You get, you know, very hierarchical societies with aristocrats, slaves, commoners, and all sorts of various things. But hunter-gatherers who don't store, we call them immediate return hunter-gatherers. Hunter-gatherers who um, hunt and gather and consume the food without storing it, they are egalitarian. There's no, there's, there's no way they can not be egalitarian. You, you get a huge lot of meat and you share it around and the women are in charge of that sharing. Um, now, what, what also happens is that, that you have, you have um, these rhythms and there are two, clearly two basic clocks. You've got the sun um, and you've got the moon. So seasonality is important. You have rainy seasons and dry seasons, um, hot and cold, slightly different in Africa, of course. You know, we have day and night. That's another important rhythm. You don't do the same things at night as you do during the day. You can see during the day. You can't see during the night, although the lions can see. But of course, the moon is equally important. And in so many ways, um, in terms of mythology, ritual, tradition, and in my view, human evolution, in some ways even more important than um, the sun because the moon is, is a sufficiently slow rhythm somewhere between a day and a year to be able to plan ahead and, and organize the most important economic activity of the society, which is the rhythm between hunting and, and, and in other words, the production of meat and, and, you know, and, and consumption. So you have a, an oscillation. And um, this leads me to um, a relatively recent, brilliant um, insight by one of my former um, students, Morna Finnegan. And I'll just say that quite quickly. She did field work under Jerome Lewis among the Bayaka in um, the Congo. And um, with the Bayaka, the women rule and then the men rule. And I say, <laughs> so, so the women's rule is uh, they have a ritual, it's called Nagoku. And once, roughly once a month, the women decide they need to kind of make their point to the men. And there's plenty of filming of this. You can just see it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a laughing, raucous display of matriarchal power by the women who use all their weaponry. And by their weaponry, I mean they just use their sexual attractiveness in a kind of raucous, provocative way, making fun of men's performance in bed, making teasing men about how good they are at sex. To, when they, they they invade the whole area of the camp, the men, you know, they they kind of, you know, they're they're, they're kind of laugh at it a little bit. They're kind of slightly embarrassed, but they, you know, it is actually quite a scary event. The women really do take power, and they do, and they keep that power for a period of several days, perhaps as much as a week. Um, and then the and then the women think, okay, we made our point. And and when the women do what I'm calling taking the power. It, it, there's this word which is, doesn't translate very well in English or so many other languages. We call it ritual, but it, ritual doesn't mean mumbo jumbo. <laughs> ritual means a huge collective effervescence, a huge community event which gives meaning to life. The women's nagoku is the meaning of the life, and and it's the spirit of nagoku is the spirit of womanly power, and it takes over. And with, and if it doesn't take over, the idea is things will go wrong. And the forest won't like it, and the forest won't supply its abundance, won't supply the you know the fruit and the, the animals that, that the, the human beings need in order to be to be happy. Anyway, the women perform the goku, take over power. It's a kind of matriarchy, but beautifully, the women, you know, they think, okay, we made our point. And and I've always thought this: it's so important in a revolution to take the power, but isn't it equally important to surrender it? Because just think about it, if you don't know how to surrender the power, you can't do your revolution all over again. If you keep, if you take the power and try to hold on to it, you're going to, you're going to destroy the whole thing. You're going to destroy the whole point. So what the, what the, what those women do, they take the power, then they let it go. And they actually let the men take over. And you might think, well, that's a stupid thing to do. They're letting the men be patriarchs. And the men do come up with their thing called a jengi, which is a huge celebration of the penis. I mean, they have this huge big thing which pops up and down. It sort of ejaculates with all these reeds and stuff. And they stromp up and down. They stride. They show what real men they are. They're very powerful hunters. And the women actually encourage that. But they, they do that in order to provoke themselves. Like the older women want 
to, to make the point that men can be dangerous because at a certain point, the women will think, okay, enough is enough. Um, and the men kind of understand that as well. So the men do a jengi, and then once they've made their point, everything goes back to normal and life carries on for a week or two, just you know, doing normal everyday things. And then the women come back with the nogoku. So you have women's power, men's power, women's power, men's power. It's a pendulum. Why does that matter? It matters because the human revolution, which is the topic we started with, when it happened, it wasn't just a singular event, which as time went on, moved further and further and further back into the distant past till it was just a memory. The human revolution was one and then lost on purpose, one and then lost on purpose, one and then lost on purpose, precisely so that the joy of revolution, the laughter, the empowerment, the, the excitement of going through a revolution was actually the thing which organized society. Society has always been organized from bottom up because the top down stuff kind of happens, but it, all it does is justify another bottom up revolution. And um, I tend to think that if in the future we are to make this planet something which is going to be um, alive for our grandkids, something like that is going to be required. In other words, the idea of some bunch, even however nice these people are, <laughs> how much we think they're the right crowd, the working class, if the entire international working class, of course, you know, it's a bit difficult to think of this these days. Things are going rather wrong, of course, all around the planet. Um, but, you know, while there's life, there's hope. And I still do have, I'm still kind of clinging to hope. I need it. But just let's just have a thought experiment. Imagine we have this insurrection. It's a women's insurrection. It's something like what was happening in Ukraine a few years ago, what has been happening in Iran more recently. But as a real massive uprising of not just women, but their, their male comrades, the entire working class inspired by this revolution. We could write around the entire planet. We've got the entire planet in our hands. I would still say, now what do we do? And um, I'm just thinking, as long as it doesn't become real, as long as we, when we let go and kind of let the other side come back, we're sufficiently well-equipped, well-prepared, sufficiently, you know, thinking in advance, we can let people, if they really want to, if they want borders, if they want to dress up in military uniforms, if they want to do the stock exchange, if that's how they feel, as long as they, they, they know they've got two weeks, only two weeks, to completely reconstruct a financial system, a capitalist economic system, borders, territories, all the rest of it, because we're going to do the revolution again. I hope you can see that the, that 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 temporary moment of, I don't know, call it pretend play capitalism, if you like, it would just be play. It wouldn't be real, but it might be enough to provoke the next revolution and the next one and the next one. I can only say, yeah, all right. I know can you, a lot of you are going to think that's complete moonshine, Chris. I have been told that. Um, but it is what happened. It is how we became human. There was no single revolution people didn't sit back and think oh we've got communism now oh that's right fine we can we're all we're all comfy now yet. no no communism as and this is Mona's contribution she calls it communism in motion you something you establish you you need a revolution to establish it but you don't just need one revolution you need to let go in order to have the next one and the next one and the next one and there are some parts of the world where their revolution is still rumbling on um, and um, this part of the Congo, I mean, it is getting rather threatened these days um, with logging and alcohol and stuff. It's uh, it's sort of um, on, a, on a knife edge. But until, until living memory, even now, actually, that 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 pendulum of power between the genders has still been swinging up, swinging and, and keeping keeping things moving in in one or two parts of the planet. Um, and, and that particular part isn't the only one. The, the Hads are another one. They have their major ritual every dark moon. There are places in Amazonia and other parts of the world where that, that amazing revolution which made us human is still um, throbbing away.